Okay, hello everybody. Thank you very much for the wait and for uh, joining us today. Um, I hope this message actually finds you well, everybody, wherever you are. Uh, we're super lucky again, um, Juan Gonzalez Bendi is with us today. The, this month we're talking, as you know, about managing the performance environment and our core value is unity. And um, Juan is a remarkable professional in this subject. So we're really, really happy uh, to have him here. He's also a friend of the rush. Um, so Juan, if you actually want to go ahead and, and introduce yourself, um, you're, you're, you're the celebrity today, so. I wish, I wish. No red carpet. There was a red carpet, I wonder. Hi, how's everyone? Uh, I hope you're all well and, and safe wherever you are. Uh, absolute pleasure to be here once again. Um, we've had a few conversations in the past with yourself and, and Chris P, who's another legend, so. So yeah, just delighted, delighted to be here. Very good, Juan. Thanks very much. Oh, by the way, um, we're not that many, so please feel encouraged to raise your hand. Um, if you want to say something, as soon as I see it, I'll unmute you and, and you know, take, take the chance to, take the chance to ask whatever, whatever you would like. Um, Juan, would you like to give us a little bit of background on what you do and how you got where, where you are? Not, not, not specifically to Dubai, but in your, in your life and your career. Yeah, um, I guess it's, um, I don't know how it normally works for you, Pablo, but I think it'd be great if people could turn on their cameras. I think Absolutely. it turns it a little bit if you guys don't mind. more personal. If you don't mind, if you can, if you're dressed, it'd be great if you can, if you can turn the cameras on. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, how we go to this conversation, uh, it's a long story, I don't want to bore people too much, I guess. Um, I'm quite curious, I'm quite a, a curious individual, um, I think I'm, I'm, I'm eager to learn. Um, I've been working in grassroots all the way to performance environments um, for over 15, perhaps almost touching on 20 years now, which is scary, to say the least. Um, uh, yeah, always an education background, um, and uh, one day I decided to come out of that very, very comfortable life that was teaching, working in a, an independent private boarding school in the UK, where all your meals were ready, everything was uh, with a schedule, and people were ready to go to jump into um, uh, professional sports, and that was... That was a big if, um, and there were lots of conversations with my family around it. Um, and yeah, uh, since then, I've always been connected to education, but I'm not full-time employed anymore. Um, and yeah, founded my, my own sort of, I don't, don't really know what to call it. I guess it's a company, it's a registered company, but I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure if, if you go and look company in the dictionary, I'm not quite sure if it's the mold. Um, and yeah, uh, I'm lucky enough to be working with what is now over 100 organizations around the world. Uh, and I'm very, very proud to say, it's probably my, my, one of my biggest uh, uh, achievements, which is I've been back to, to about 90% of those organizations at least twice already, uh, if not more. So yeah, um, I think in a nutshell, that's, that's about it really. Um, how we got to here, well, it's, it's very warm outside, so I'm in a nice aircon bedroom right now. Where it's, it's, it's my boardroom, so I feel like a lot of sugar right now in a big in a big boardroom. I guess it's the equivalent of the American uh, Trump before all this mess. So we're not going to go there. We're not going to go there. Very good. Um, so Juan, South America coaching. Um, what is it about? How, how, how's the story with it? Yeah, um, it started a few years ago now. I think it must be going over three years now. Um, mainly working again with educational organizations. Um, then it went to grassroots. Uh, we've got a few people that are working for four months as well. Um, I'm connected with some governing bodies as well. So trying to offer uh, support to the organizations around the, the player development and the coach development mainly, um, but we also try to uh, I keep saying we, it's just me, by the way. So 
<laughs> it's um, I yeah I try to support the development around the organization in terms of the decision makers as well. Um, we've done some bits with with officials, um, and I've done some bits with parents uh, as well. If if they're working with with children, um, uh, we try to get them into the process as much as we can. Um, so that's pretty much it, really. Um, the majority of them are related to my main sport, which is rugby union. Um, I would say about 60% of them will be within rugby union. And again, all the way from grassroots to, to governing bodies. Um, I'm actually working with a local governing body on, on Friday here. Uh, and we did again last Friday. So excited about, about that. Um, uh, yeah, we do, we do a bit of everything really. Every single program is different. Um, uh, I like to call them 360 degree programs where we try to touch upon all the, all the members of the organization to have a, uh, the biggest impact uh, that, I can, that I can generate. And then also um, trying to, to go beyond a, a residential intervention or a workshop. Um, and yeah, try basically to say, okay, well, uh, how can you get your own facilitators uh, sort of working with your own coaches and trying to develop your own players uh, rather than me having to, to come in and continue the whole, uh, the whole program. So uh, there's a number of very successful stories um, where I've been perhaps two or three times in the year uh, and we have some interventions online and we've done some bits um, uh, remotely and then um, uh, they've gone on to create their own programs they've gone on to create their own developers within the organization um, and I think those are the, the the best success stories I would say uh, it's not great for the business when when you're not going as usual um, but obviously that's that's what I'm trying to create people that have become independent. Uh, we talked about coaches becoming redundant and it's a bit of a cliche, uh, but I'm going to use that cliche. Yeah, I, I'd like to become redundant at one point um, and say, well, I've supported this organisation and then they've gone on to to generate their own, basically. So, so again, in a nutshell, that's that's what I'm trying to do. Completely, completely. You know, I was, I was telling one of my players, yeah, the exact same thing. I was telling him, when I feel I think I told him when I feel like you need me too much, I start wondering if I'm doing a good job. Um, you know, like I should develop you in a way that you don't need me so much um, and be redundant, like you say. Absolutely. And I've, I've done some work around the, the exec world, um, so around the company world, the business world. Um, and they're very reluctant. I think they're a lot more reluctant that, than sports or education as such um, to let go. Yes, so, so managers will will support their teams in a very different way. Um, I think it's got to do with traditions and um, some beliefs that've been there for some time, and uh, and obviously productivity as well. So um, mm -hmm. I think we're a lot better in sports and education to let go a little bit um, that in the corporate world, at least in, in my experience. Completely. Juan, um, I'll take you uh, right on to the topic that we're trying to debate this month, that it's, um, as I was saying before, managing the performance environment. And, and if you don't mind me, I'd like to read the definition of it by the U.S. soccer, at least how, it, how it's explained. Um, it says, um, influence on and off the field circumstances and persons in order to create the best possible conditions for the development and performance of the players. Um, it's a very broad Definition. Let's say, what are the key areas that come to your mind when we when we hear to this statement? Yeah, I agree with you. I think it's a, it's a little bit vague. Um, it's a big it's, it's a big definition. Um, it wants to keep everyone happy and go with the trend. Uh, but I think I think the heart is in the right place. I think they're trying they're trying to get there. Um, I would always talk with organisations around what is our decision-making process based upon? Um, and I think if in that process, we don't come to the participant, the child, the player, uh, even the coaches, um, I think we are away from it. Um, 
actually, I, I started a job in 2016. I was director of sports at, at an independent school in the UK. Um, and after 10 days in the job, I sat down with the, um, with the principal. Uh, she was the decision maker of the, of the organization. Um, and I had to establish some priorities um, and we couldn't get our priorities aligned. So we were debating if it was more like a discussion, I should say. Uh, we were debating what was the priority if we were going to choose the children, if we were going to choose the parents or the staff. Um, and let's put it this way, her one, two, three didn't match my one, two, three. Um, and, I, and I was only in that job for about 11 months until I decided to, to, to go for new pastures. Uh, yeah. Don't get me wrong, I learned a lot. Um, but I think that conversation was key in that process. Um, because I would put the children in, in, in number one and she wouldn't. Um, and I think since, since that, uh, obviously our, our directions, our, our, our vision of, of, of that school was, was very different. Um, but again, uh, I think it should be a base around how we're making decisions in the organization um, and who I would always start with the why, like someone Senex talks about in his golden circle. I would always start with the why. Um, I would go to the how, and then I would go to the what. Uh, I sit down in rooms like this with, with lots of organizations, and they normally would have the, the what very, very clear. And they've had lots of conversations around what is it that they're trying to do. Um, they've had some sort of conversations around how they're going to try to do that. Um, but it, uh, yeah, I would say in the majority of the cases, it's been a long time since, it, since they debated why is it that they're trying to do what they do. Um, so that would be, that would be a, a trigger that I would put up on a big screen 95% uh, of the times that I'm talking with people. Very good. In fact, just, just for the record, in case somebody hasn't seen it, so the, his points relating to, he's referring to um, Simon Sinek has this um, wonderful TED talk, actually, that you can find on YouTube about, um, how is it that he calls it? How is it that it's, it's titled in the, the... Golden Circle. The Golden Circle, yeah. It's a wonderful TED talk about the why, the how, and the, and the what of every organization. Yeah. Very good. Um, when, um, like you were saying, and in, 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 in especially because you were saying the first priority is the child or the participant, and um, um, I, we've, we've spoken about this before, about participants in certain learning learning environments that it's uh, in yeah. particular something that you specialize in. Um, and I think uh, the, 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 the phrase is becoming more popular among coaching, but I don't know if everybody can actually explain it or really refer to what we're talking about. How, how, how would you explain it? How would you actually present uh, this idea to others? Yeah, again, I mean, I'm going to say repetitive. I think it's going to do with, with, um, with the decision-making process again and how, how we're taking those decisions upon the individual. Um, most, most of the environments around sports for the last 20 years have had some sort of relation with education. Um, and I would say for the last 50 to 60 years, if not more, um, education had to do with somebody um, on a step, literally. My first classroom in the first school that I worked in the UK, um, this is not too, too many years ago, it's 2008, um, had a step in my classroom. Yeah, so it was an, it was an old school funded in 1525. And I still had a step in my classroom. Uh, and I turned it into I turned it into a stage rather than a step. Yeah. So I put I base everything. So my, my desk and everything, I basically had the what used to be the back of the classroom. I remember the guys from IT having to move all the cables and everything. They weren't very happy with me in week one. Um, and I turned it into some sort of uh, stage where people would perform and they would um, they would express themselves, they would present, which I think is a key skill. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's, that's just an example. Um, but yet again, I think there's been, there's been this thing in education for the last um, a couple of decades or so that, um, I mean, fr from the Latin, I mean, the, the alumni, yeah, so the, the pupil, 
uh, is that one that needs the light and needs to be illuminated, okay? Who's going to give them that light? Is that person at the front of the room? It used to be mainly a, a, a man. Um, um, they would tell them what they needed to learn. Uh, and they would, tell you, they would tell them how they needed to learn it. And if they were extremely lucky, they would have told them why they needed to learn it. Um, I think those roles and that process has now been completely flipped upside down. Um, and I think we're starting with the why once again. People are learning in a very different way. Uh, but I think we've got a lot of resilient beliefs that are still within that component of, well, there is a person over there on a step. He or she has got the light and these people here are the darkness. Um, so again, I mean, long, 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 long wide answer, I guess, but um, I think we need to move from that. I think, I think we understand that people learn a lot better um, when they are using collaboration, when they are creating together, when they are presenting, when they're interacting, when they're having discussions, discussions to what it used to mean to have a, a discussion, yeah? It's not an argument. It's two different words, yeah? Um, and it's two very different scenarios as well. Um, and I think that, again, just, just to quote a couple, but the most successful educational systems in the world are actually following those, those patterns and those foundations. Um, the, Finnish, the Finnish educational system, which I've been lucky enough to spend some time over there, uh, fabulous country, fabulous people. Um, they actually they actually following this to the letter. Uh, and they're starting at the youngest possible age as well. Um, we're starting to see, um, there's a fascinating TED talk uh, by architect Tezuka. Um, I'll paste it on the chat in a second. Um, they've actually started to design buildings around the participant, around the children that goes to those that go to those kindergartens. Um, and I use it a lot when, when, I'm, when, when I'm mentoring. Um, so again, I mean, th there's a few examples over there. Um, I, I'm, I'm gonna struggle to, to answer to your question with a, with a paragraph in terms of this is what a participant set environment looks like. Um, but I think it's gonna do with leveling, it's gonna do with uh, trying to educate in a very different way uh, um, to what we used to. Um, I think it's going to do with uh, just treating others like like people and, and, and treating others like, again, a bit of a cliche, but how we like to be treated and, and, and everybody's level, everybody's in the same, um, everybody's in the same uh, sort of status and, and, and we're all having a good time together. Um, last bit I'm going to throw into to that, again, long-winded answer, is going to do with, with fun it's going to do with now having tangible empirical evidence, so scientific evidence um, from Amanda Vesic and, and Heather Manix, um, where they talk about the fan maps and they, they now have got evidence uh, that what we believe for the last many, many years, which was related to people having fun, being in a nice environment, um, where people that were actually learning better. Um, now we know that, now, now we can confirm that, okay? So it's always been a belief, yeah, so the best sessions in your club, those are the sessions that uh, are related with having fun and, and uh, a cool person that is trying to facilitate it. Um, if people try to relate uh, to their schooling experience, they will probably relate to, okay, so if I ask you what have been your best experience in school, what subjects did you enjoy the most and why? Um, I'm sure there's going to be somewhere in that journey, somebody that was uh, in the classroom with you, facilitating a good time, having a bit of fun, having a bit of a laugh. Um, and again, they were trying to go in a slightly different direction to what I was describing earlier. So yeah, I think leveling, um, trying to trying to edu educate in a different way and, and having a good time, having fun, I think would be, would be my pillars, I guess. Mm -hmm. One, and, and the, if you don't mind me asking, and I'm sorry if this is sidetracking a little bit, but you mentioned the, the Finnish educational system and uh, you had the, the, the opportunity to, to, to visit and to experience it. 
Um, I didn't know that actually, and I yeah. think that's fascinating because um, I remember reading an article about it. It's not only considered the best educational system in the world, um, it's also completely public. And I read once a stat that I thought it was incredible. That was like something like 70% of the students in high school actually want to be teachers in the future, which is it's, it's insane. Um, what did you see in your experience? What was so, so, so great, what, that's a way, it's a bad way to express it, but. Yeah, I've just, I've just sent you um, that TED talk from architect Tezuka. And I've just sent you another, there's two links in that long wide link over there in the chat um, from Michael Moon, which is a fellow American of yours, um, a very well-known director, uh, where he actually travels to Finland and tries to compare the American system with the Finnish system. And believe me, it's 12 minutes that will actually blow your head off. If you mm -hmm. haven't watched that, you guys need to go and watch that because it's just fascinating. This is a blog that directed things like Bowling for Columbine and supersized me with the guy eats mm -hmm. McAdoo's McDonald's for about 30 days and he ends up, so he ends up. But anyway, um, yeah, it was really cool. I, I've been doing some work with the Finnish um, Ice Hockey Federation uh, and the American, actually, USA Hockey. Um, uh, they've got a really cool um, coach development program. Uh, obviously, those two nations are on the top uh, top three, I would say, in terms of ice hockey in the world. Um, and I think it's really cool, the fact that they've come together and they've said, look, we want to push each other to try to become even better. Um, and they get together a couple of times a year. I, I don't think they've been able to do it this year. Uh, but last time, uh, they were in November. Uh, I was in uh, a couple of hours north from Helsinki, uh, coldest place in the world by a mile. Um, um, yeah, they just got together and, and chatted coaching for a couple of days and we went to watch a couple of games and, and had a few sessions with coaches, with grassroots coaches and performance coaches as well. Um, there were a couple of guys that, that, that were with the, with the national sides as well. Um, so yeah, really cool. And then I, I got in touch through um, somebody that I know, which was, was trying to develop rugby over there, rugby union. Um, I said, look, uh, what would you say about giving me a contact from your children's school, from the principal or the, or the uh, headmaster, headmistress, whoever? Um, they say, yeah, straight away, I send an email, copying my, my mate in. Um, she replies straight away, uh, Rochelle is her name. Uh, she's a legend. And she said, yeah, we'll be happy to have you. Uh, I just need some details of you because of child protection, whatever it's called, safeguarding. And then, um, yeah, within, within a couple of months, uh, I was there and, and I spent a couple of days at the school. They gave me access to absolutely everything. Um, and I just ask why every 30 seconds. And yeah, I just got a lot of information, spent a lot of time with nine and 10 year old children, which were really cool. Um, spent about 10 minutes getting changed to go out to play time, break time. Uh, and then about 10 minutes trying to unfold and get, get him back. Um, there were no bells. So people would manage their, their lessons as they wanted to be managed. The children were managing their lessons actually. So the children wanted to stay in and finish their projects or whatever they were working on. Um, I mean, we, we could do an hour on, on those two days, but uh, the coolest thing, the whole school had the same syllabus for that week or those two weeks or whatever it was. And when I was there, it was about chocolate. So they were learning through chocolate. Everything happened. Well, everything that was happening between the ages of um, six and 13, seven and 13 was like a primary school, like a prep school in England, um, was happening around chocolate. So it was related with history and where chocolate came from and how to go to the Americas and chemistry, how chocolate would melt and solidify and what was happening in that process. Uh, it had to be with, uh, I don't know, I mean, you name it, uh, geography, uh, and why would cacao uh, grow in certain parts of the, I mean, it was, it was just fascinating. I mean, I, I wanted to send my, my daughter to that school. To uh, I've been around hundreds of schools in my life, and I've never 
had that feeling after 10 minutes of being there of saying, Catalina, who's my daughter, she's four. Um, she's dancing opposite a stage of karaoke right now. Um, and I just want to send her there. I, I never had that feeling in my life. And I've been in around, I don't know, 50, 60 schools in my life. Um, it was unreal. It was absolutely unbelievable. That's amazing. That's amazing. And um, if, if you don't mind me asking you this, it maybe connects with what you just said. Um, if you had to give an example of, um, or compare by opposition on a coach center or player center type of environment, yeah. um, what would be the example that you would share with, with coaches? Oh, there's loads. There's loads. Um, I mean, the, the one we just spent a good five minutes on, that would be a very, very good one. Obviously, it isn't sports related, but I think people get an idea. Um, I've been lucky enough to, to spend some time around England rugby, um, all the way through the pathway here, yeah, for the development pathway. Um, and I would say it, it's pretty much development and uh, child participant centre. Um, so there are some core values of the union um, that uh, they got to do with respect, with teamwork, with solidarity, camaraderie. Um, uh, I'm forgetting a couple now, but uh, but the new one that they brought into the performance pathway is going to do with togetherness and how people stick together. Um, obviously, you could be under a lot of pressure in a sports like, like rugby. Um, it's a very physical sport here. Um, uh, basically, when you stick together, you're obviously going to become stronger. Um, so I think bringing in those concepts that actually come from the players um, is a very good example. Um, players spend a lot of time talking in English rugby at the moment. Um, and they spend a lot of time making, the, making their own decisions, making their own mistakes. Um, again, I've been lucky enough to be around some premiership environments uh, of the top level in the country and some grassroots as well. And they they would be trying to, obviously there are different worlds, yeah, but they would be trying to, to get to those, uh, to those status of, of being playing centre. Um, I mean, how it looks in reality, it looks like players leading their own team meetings. It looks like um, people not shouting from the touchline, what decisions they should be, uh, the, or, or what options they should be taking. Uh, so in rugby, if you get a penalty, you can either kick to touch, which is the, the lateral line here, yeah, the, the throwing in line. Um, yeah, you can kick to the post, yeah, you can get some points by, by kicking between the posts, or you can tap the ball and play. Um, and we see a lot of less people, every time there's a penalty, sort of looking for answers uh, outside the pitch. So I think that's that's a good example again. Um, and I've seen lots of people looking for answers outside the pitch uh, and, and giving away some some defense, uh, some tackles or whatever it is. Um, so that's always interesting. Um, yeah, I think I think those those examples will summarize uh, pretty well. Um, I've I've read some stuff around. Uh, some people that, that will resonate the the American uh, 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 women's football, uh, women's soccer. Yeah, um, I think by reading some stuff and sort of touching base with some people that are waiting the pathway, uh, it sounds very player um, centered as well. Um, it sounds like uh, uh, people were made, taking the decisions, and there was a leadership group and. Uh, again, there was there were um, within within their team. Uh, there was a lot of mentoring going on. Uh, there was a lot of um, people coming in from other environments, uh, so military, other sports, um, arts, yeah, and trying to sort of relate uh, how a team works. Um, so yeah, I mean, you obviously are, some of you guys must be a lot more familiar with those processes that obviously ended up winning winning the World Cup. Yeah. Um, so it sounded to me that that was very, uh, very player-centre related, I would say. 
Yeah, exactly. In fact, you, you gave an example, a really good example that I liked before that so you were saying in your own story that the first thing that you did at the, at the school was turn the step into stage. Um, that's that's very player center as well. Um, and you were also mentioning that um, something that we discussed in the past is it's not a it's not a fashion the idea of being player center. There's a lot of now we count on a lot of scientific studies that actually justify why we're trying to do things this way. Um, are there any particular um, studies that you think are a must for coaches to know um, and to to, uh, I mean, as to why we approach learning environments in a player in a player center way. Yeah, I mean, you lost you lost signal for a little bit, or, or my oh. reception wasn't great. But I think you're after you're after some authors or some studies from player yeah. center. You have some names. Yeah, exactly. Like that was for, right? for example. I, I remember you mentioned one. Yeah, cool. Um, um, yeah, right. look, uh, I mean, there's hundreds of them, but. I've lost you again, mate. I th I th I'm, I th I'm sorry. I think I have a delay in my connection, but go ahead, man. Okay. Um, very hard, very hard to, to try to summarize. Um, go to Carol Dweck, Mindsets. Uh, go to Angela Duckworth, uh, Grit. Go to Daniel Coyle, The Talent Code and The Culture Code. Um, uh, Professor Richard Bailey, Bailey as in the drink, um, he's got over, I think it's 95 or 96 papers published. Um, he will have a lot around learning styles, learning myths. Um, he will criticize a lot of other studies as well. Um, who else? Uh, oof. Um, Lots, lots of man. If you want to go for somebody uh, a little bit, something a little bit easier to read, uh, the Scortex graph itself, I think it was is one of my, one of my bibles. I would say uh, Bill Walsh, former 49ers coach, um, uh, Pete Carroll, um, and his book on leadership, uh, the legend of John Wooden, uh, Wooden on on leadership. Uh, mate, there's hundreds. Uh, who else? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll give you a few podcasts and stuff if you don't mind. Um, somebody like Stuart Armstrong um, on the talent equation. Uh, he's very cool. We've done some bits together. Um, he was cool before doing bits with me, by the way. A lot cool. Um, uh, Jonah Sullivan, who I know is a very good friend of Rush. Um, he'll have some very cool stuff out there. Um Mate, I'll, look, if people want to connect, uh, that that's my social media over there. Uh, I'll send you, I'll send you a couple of PDFs that got about uh, over a hundred titles and podcasts and uh, bits for you to. Well, I'll send it to you if you want to distribute that as well. Uh, but mate, that, that's that, there's loads actually. There's there's very cool stuff out there at the moment. Very good. Thanks for that, man. Um. I'm going to take you a little bit more to uh, something that I remember that I think it's it's great for everybody to know and uh, and to listen to that um, from a previous conversation that we had actually it was something that always resonates with me is um, you told me and I think you told Chris as well uh, once that your favorite coaches were the ones that don't plan based on Saturday's game <laughs> and I always like that 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 phrase, and um, because I think it has a huge impact. How would you how would you explain that to others? Um, look, it, re it really I think it really depends, and and we use that word. It depends in coaching a lot to try to get out of trouble. But um, look, I, I wouldn't I, I wouldn't generalize. I wouldn't say don't plan for the game. Uh, there is an element of the game that I think we need to we need to attend. Um, uh, the players will feel that anxiety and that urgency of of who have we got on Saturday or Sunday or whatever it is. Um, but yeah, I will try to base their development around themselves. Um, and I think Saturday game is just another part of their development. Um, I think there's there's a lot of opportunity to develop elsewhere. 
Um, and no, no games. Look, if, if, if there is in a World, fi- a World Cup final, I, again, I don't think it's the end of the world whatsoever. Whatever the league, whatever the status, whatever the knockout or whatever it is, um, I would say base it around their, their needs, base it around what they need to they need to improve, what they're really good at as well. Sometimes we coaches just base our our sessions around what people need need to become better at, and perhaps they're really good at something, and we're not we're not trying to get them to be really good at something. Um, I would I would personally have an idea about the individuals that, I, that I've got in front of us. And then I will try to um, get them to whatever they can they can get themselves. Um, and obviously, the game is a part of that puzzle. Um, sometimes, for a lot of colleagues, for a lot of people that I come across, it would be a very big part of the puzzle, a, a massive piece of that of that jigsaw. Um, and I don't believe it's, it, it should be that that huge especially in grassroots, especially with children. Um, I think our practices will definitely need to relate with the game and will have to look like the game. Um, and again, we should build that pressure. We should build that scenario of being 2-1 down with three minutes to go. And we just took the keeper out and we got 12 players on the field um, and see what happens. Uh, I think we should be building the, those those environments within practice. Um, and yet again, if we spend our time trying to make practice good look, uh, sorry, good good uh, good look good, sorry, um, and trying to get back into our cars and drive back home and uh, thinking we are really good coaches because everything just went according to plan and. There were no balls loose. Everybody was doing what they had to do, and everybody was running to cone A to cone B, etc. Um, I think long term, we are actually making the players a disfavour um, because we're not putting them in a scenario where it looks like the game. Again, I mean, your question. I think I've deviated a little bit from your question, but I would spend some time relating. What just happened last week? What could happen next week? But it would be a part of a big puzzle, of a big master plan um, that is based around the development of the players. Okay. No, and in fact, I might, I might continue. Maybe I'm, I'm deviating now, but um, you said two things that I, that I think that are super interesting. Um, one of them is. Um, this is huge for coaching, in my opinion, that you were saying, like, careful with going home and thinking that everything went well because nobody lost the ball. Um, and I remember you mentioned once that you want to see failure in your in your sessions in a way, and that you, that you try to work on a right. I think you said that you, you try to work on like a 70 30 if you could idealize the number of mistakes and successes within the, the session. How, how, how's that? Um, I'm going to I'm going to kidnap your webinar if you don't mind. Absolutely. Um, I want I want to get people involved. If that's okay, uh, oh, guys. If, if you can if you can type in the chat, um, what's your definition of failure, or perhaps not even a definition. What's the first thing you think when you think about fail, Ling? No trying, San Juan. Some of their experience. Let's see who's awake. Let's see this is a good, good temperature meter. No discipline, says Andrew. A learning moment, learning, cool. Learning opportunity. Okay, cool. I'll leave you to read, that's cool. Sorry, sorry, Pablo, this is the host in me. Trying I like to it, I like people, it, I like it. Trying to, trying to get people in. Lack of effort, says Mauricio. Cool. I'm not. I'm not quite sure where. Th- thanks, guys. This, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. Um, I'm not quite sure where was the source of this, but um, many years ago, somebody showed me this thing. 
There was a little, it was a little image from the internet it said fail, so F A I L, so first attempt in learning. So some of you guys must be in education, I would have thought. Um, and for me to date, it's been impossible to identify a learning theory or a learning, an educational tendency, let's call it, that does not involve failing, that does not involve making mistakes. So if we go all the way back to Piaget and, and everything that's come since then, and, um, and there's, there's been lots of big names in, in the middle that are related to the science of learning. And um, uh, I, know, I mean, it, it all started with Piaget, I would have thought, uh, and then we came all the way uh, to, to, to the last 15 years or so, and, and people like uh, Andres Ericsson and his book Peak, and um, again, there's, there's lots more out there, Daniel Coyle again, and uh, all of them talk about, all, all of them talk about, well, what do we need to do to become better? Well, what we need to do is go through experiences, okay? And it might only take us one experience, it might only take us one attempt, okay? But that doesn't mean we master that. That doesn't mean we're actually great at doing something. Um, every time I start talking about learning and failing, um, there's a great resource uh, going around the internet from Tony Hawk. Yeah, uh, some of you on this side of 30, like myself, will uh, know who Tony Hawk is. He's uh, biggest name in skateboarding uh, ever. So he popularized skateboarding. Um, believe it or not, he's 57 years old. Um, which makes me feel very old as well. But anyway, um, there is this clip um, on YouTube somewhere. It's about seven, eight minutes. And he's trying to combine three tricks that have never been combined before. Nobody has ever done it, to his knowledge. Um, and he's got a, I think he's, he's dropping off his kids at school um, and so on. And he's got about five hours to actually master this combination of tricks, yeah, which is a new trick on itself. I don't know if they're called tricks or, but you know what I mean, yeah, hopefully. And then, yeah, it, it's pretty much what goes on through his head and what's happening every time he's, he's attempting stuff. Um, and it's fascinating, it's fascinating because the, it's himself in a half pipe uh, with a crew and he's talking to the crew, there's no one else there. He's got the three o'clock or whenever it is uh, the sort of deadline and he's talking after every single attempt. I'm not going to tell you how it ends for you to go and, and have a watch, um, but it's fascinating. I mean, it's, um, it, it, there are low, I mean, you, you could unpick those seven minutes um, uh, and, and write about 25 books because it's just, just fascinating. But um, long story short, if your players are not making mistakes in your practices, um, I'm not quite sure if they are developing or even becoming better football players, soccer players, sorry. Okay. Um, if everything is going well in your practice, I think you need to, to look at your environment um, to see how that relates to the game. Okay. Because I'm sure that on Saturday, or whenever you're playing your games, uh, the opposition won't turn up and tell you exactly what they're going to do exactly how they're going to run, what they're going to do on a, on a free kick or what they're going to do in a corner kick or what they're going to do when they restart the game uh, with the goalkeeper going left or whatever it is, the example. Okay? Um, so I think if your practice, which I'm sure it doesn't, but anyway, if you see practices that look perfect, so if you get a drone at the top and the actual practice looks perfect, then... We've got to change our practice, I would say. Oh, very good. Very good, very good. Um, completely, actually, completely. You want to see those mistakes. Um, I distrust my, my own session as well when I when I feel like it went too well. Like, like they haven't made a lot of mistakes. I'm like, maybe I didn't challenge them enough. Or, um, Anyway, the, the second um, the second aspect that you mentioned before that I think it's extremely interesting and um, um, especially for how often I see it on the field and I see it in the way we build curriculums and programs as well is um, you were talking 
and we were talking about weaknesses and strengths and um, something that I think in the past you've referred to as um, super abilities. Um, how is it that we always seem to be building our athletes based on correcting mistakes instead of empowering or encouraging strengths? And I think there's 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 something there. Um, but but how would you explain it in your words? What, what, what's your vision towards it? Yeah, I think I mean don't get me wrong. Um, I, I'm going to generalize again. Uh, I think it's easier. I think it's easier. We we are generally. Um, a little bit more experience and we spend a little bit more time in the game. Uh, we're usually older. Doesn't happen all the time, but most cases we will be older. Um, and it's, I think it's easier to tell somebody, look, I think you should try this with your right foot because this is an easier way to try to elude someone. Um, and that's pretty much giving somebody a solution with the best intention in the world. And then they're going to go and try that. Um, in my work, uh, in my way, most most times, um, and then I think we've, in a way, this is this is uh, something that I take away from from John O'Sullivan a lot. Basically, we're we're still in their reps, so we're still in their moments of trying to click and discover how they could be losing somebody with their right foot. Okay, um, let let let. Uh, let me, let me get this right, yeah? There are instances within a practice that we should relegate some information and we should be offering some solutions, yeah? Um, and again, it's got to do with learning. It's got to do with something that I call the learning pit, okay? And, and people could get stuck in that pit, could get stuck in that deep hole somewhere. Uh, and perhaps that, at that moment in time, they, they, they need some information where we can we can pass it on. By my experience, and this is my philosophy, sustaining to a number of authors that we've, we've already called out on, um, I think most of the times people should be exploring and, and discovering, which are two different things. Uh, why? Because we, that will enable some affordances, that will enable some, it's just a fancy word for opportunities, yeah? Um, and those opportunities will actually create solutions to the problems that we got in front of ourselves, as in players have in front of themselves. Um, I would imagine every single sport could be described as, well, this is a scenario with some problems around it. And I think most sports could be in that category um, where, I mean, independently if they are um, individual sports, team sports, cycling sports, uh, or, whatever they are. Yeah. Um, I think most of them could be defined by the fact that there are some problems around um, the participant and that participant is going to try to solve them. Yeah. Um, so yet again, if they are not trying to solve those problems within their practices, then in that scenario of going on to a game will become really hard. Um, and yeah, I'm going, to, I'm, I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to leave it there for now. What, what, what do you think about about this? This is a situation that I encounter a lot, that I, and that I, that I tend to discuss or debate. I'm, I'm not saying that I have the answer at all, but um, this is what I see. And I'm gonna I'm gonna give a, a silly example. Actually, is um, we have this forward. Oh, he's really um, he's really good at drilling, and he's really good at shooting with his right foot. But he's he's not so good at shooting with his left foot. He's not really good at defending. We should work on his defending because we want it to be well-rounded. And I'm like, okay, but is that actually more effective? And of, of course, there are a million factors to consider. But um, is that actually more effective than saying, why don't why don't we work on making him the best in the world? Are the two things that he's actually good, okay. and then just yeah, administrate yeah. in the ones that he's bad at? Yeah, no, I agree. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't quite answer your your question. <coughs> uh, so thank you for bringing it back on, onto the table, but. Um, yeah, I think, look, there'll be, there be lots of coaches working out there with the best teams in the world, yeah? Um, with people that make very few mistakes. Um, and those are the coaches actually talking about super players, talking about super skills. Um, so I've been fortunate enough to, um, 
to spend some time with uh, with lots of them coaches. And um, if you guys are looking for another book, uh, Seven's Heaven, uh, Ben Ryan. Um, he is an English rugby union coach who spent a number of years um, working with with his uh, with his union. Yeah, working with the RFU. Um, then he went on to Fiji, which is a little island in the Pacific, very well known for the rugby sevens. So um, they play seven aside, yeah, and they play in a very particular way. Okay, and they very they play in a very non-traditional way, and with those set of skills that they develop pretty much at the beach uh, around the island, yeah, they they actually went on to win uh, the first. Uh, gold medal, the first Olympic medal for Fiji ever, uh, and a number of World Series, which is basically the the um, the first division seventh tournament, which which is played around the world in ten stages. Um, and he talks about this a lot. He talks about the fact that they were the best in the game at offloading the ball, which is a skill where you're trying to pass the ball under pressure. Um, and he said, well. We don't want to be the best in the circuit. We don't want to be the best at the Olympics. We want to be the best team in history at offloading the ball. And we're not going to stop there. We want to have the best players at offloading the ball of all times. Okay, so every time somebody talks about that particular skills, and they could be talking about loads of others, uh, they will actually be comparing that skill or that player to how Fiji tries to do this. Um, so, so he would talk a lot about these these super skills. Okay, so uh, they weren't very good at defending. Okay, so they didn't like the physicality around the tackle area and stuff like that. Um, but they were very, very good. They are very, very good with the ball. Um, now, when they turn up to to the Olympics, they they got to the Olympic final um, with the I think with the it was the smallest percentage of missed tackles in the tournament. Okay, so obviously they've been improving their defense, but they never stop trying to succeed in that vision of being the best in history around offloading the ball when they were attacking. Okay, so I think that's 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 a good example. That's a great book, by the way. Uh, I read that book in a day. Um, obviously, I had a bit of time that day, but that's a different story. Um, I think I think it's a great I think it's a great book. If you guys want to go and get it, it's, it's called Seven's Heaven. Um, I don't get 10% of it or anything like that, but I think it's a great book. So, yeah, that, that's, I think that's a good example. Uh, that's, that's, a wonderful, that's a wonderful story, actually. That, that to me is also like very, very important um, concept. I, 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 see, I, see, I see too often that we spend like 90% of the time trying to correct weaknesses yeah. instead of empowering strengths. And I'm like, I don't think that's actually more effective. Well, then there are, there are studies, of course, that I suggest know, I that it might be. If, if we actually ask the players, they will probably go, will opt for something that they are really good at, yep. because that's what they want to be doing. Okay? And it's it's very rare that somebody goes and says, "So well, I'm gonna go and practice my slide shoot from the left because I can't make the ball turn that way." It's very very rare. People go and do what they're really good at, and they want to show off, and they want to spend some time, and they want to do their TikToks and the Instagram stories and stuff like that. Uh, you will never see an Instagram story or a TikTok or anything like that for the youngsters out there um, that actually has a lot of failing tricks in it. You only see the cool tricks, don't you? Very good. Um, Juan, I'm just going to move on a little bit to the next one because I want to be respectful of your time. And, uh, and I think this one is important. Um, as I was, um, when we were doing the introduction, as I was telling you, um, by the definition of the U.S. soccer managing the performance environment is on and off the field, of course. Um, what are the off the field um, aspects or um, problems, obstacles, or not necessarily a problem that you find um, and how do you work on them? How do you? Um, again, it's, it's, uh, it's a big one. Um, most of the time, I would say this, this loads of um, great things that are off the field happening. Um, lots of volunteers, lots of people that give their time to 
uh, tried to create the best possible environment with little experience, with little information. They wake up on a Sunday morning and they're there. I call them the Sunday morning warriors, uh, mums and dads that spend their time uh, trying to facilitate a cool environment for their kids and their mates, the friends. So look, uh, again, I think if we, if we put that stuff on a scale, I think the scale will be definitely on, on the great things happening sort of end. Um, yet again, I think that due to, and I'm, I'm not saying by any means of imagination that I've got it all, um, but th there is some lack of information going around um, in terms of, uh, in terms of some bits I've got to do with, with uh, fundamentals around education, um, and perhaps some more serious stuff that could do with uh, some misinformation around things like safeguarding and, and stuff like that. So, um, so let's go back to, to your question before I go again. Um, I think the organization should be responsible enough to, to bring in people with some of that information uh, for that information to be shared, okay, rather than put on a website and sort of directing parents, supporters, visiting coaches or whoever it is to the website. I think it should be something really active. Um, uh, let's put it this way. Um, people don't move to a town and just send their kids to school. They do some research, okay? They have a look at the schools, okay? They, they have a look at where they're going to move. They, they, they have a look at sort of how those children are going to spend their time. Um, and the majority of the time, people will go, okay, well, this could be the best fit for, for the child. Um, and hopefully it's done that, that way, yeah. I don't see a lot of people spending time researching around their sporting experiences. Okay, so I don't see a lot of people going to coaches going, um, hi, I'm Mr. So-and-so, that's my daughter over there. Um, would you mind if we have a conversation around the core values of the club? Or do you mind if we have a conversation around what's your playing policy? What's your selection policy? What's your traveling, non-traveling team policy? People just accept, okay? And they, they go, well, this is a sporting experience. This is how it's meant to be, okay? And I would always use the example of the restaurant, okay? So some of you, um, we'll have kids, some of you will have nephews or some sort of child in the family going around uh, putting a smile on your face. Yeah? Um, picture yourself with, 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 with that child in a restaurant. Okay? And if that child drops its fork, okay, you wouldn't allow the waitress or the waiter to come shouting at them because they dropped their fork. You wouldn't allow it, wouldn't you? If you were walking down the street and somebody starts shouting at your child, you wouldn't allow it. But yet again, in sports, we sort of accept what's, what's going on. And we got this sort of karma around character building and, and people being miserable under the, the rain and, and being wet and it happens a lot in England, believe me. Um, and people say, no, don't worry. They we're building their character. This is a life changing experience. And no, it's not. We're driving them away from the experience. They're having a miserable time. Their bodies are not ready to spend time in their temperature like our bodies are. And we are normally wearing 10 layers and they're wearing two. So again, trying to answer your question with some, uh, with some examples, but um, I think it's gonna do with information going around. I think it's gonna do with um, not accepting this is, this is what we do and sort of saying yes to everything. Um, yeah, I, I think the organization needs to, needs to be responsible around, around what they're doing. Um, and if they're gonna to try to facilitate the best learning and developmental exam, uh, environments that they can do, uh, which hopefully that is part of their mission, uh, then they should be giving out some information, bringing people in and stuff like that. And again, I don't think it's a budget issue. I don't think it's a, uh, well, we are a very small club. We cannot bring a parenting expert or we cannot bring a, somebody to talk about education or whatever it is. I think, I think 
there will be lots of resources around the club. I think we need to be creative around how we're trying to do what we do, regardless of the type of organization, grassroots performance or, or whatever in the middle uh, it is. Um, do you have any particular practices or strategies from a, from a coach standpoint or from a club standpoint? that you yeah. actually like in particular, something that you guys do during the year that you actually like to, to support this part? Yeah, I, I like things that are, that are alive, that, are, that don't stand still. Um, I mean, the majority of the places I go to, yeah, this is our play manual. This is our coaching philosophy. And hold on, there's going to be the dust on it. But anyway, if you want to read it this year, in this drawer is the bottom drawer on the left hand side of an office that is locked with three different padlocks over there. And Christy's laughing over there because she's seen it. But it, it, it's like that, isn't it? So let, let's make it live. Let's make it, um, uh, yeah, let's, let, let, let's make it, uh, um, let's update it. Let's, let's keep it, let's keep it going. Um, I see, I see lots of organizations where the under 10s will do their thing and the under 14s who are experts in under 10s because they did it three years ago, four years ago, um, will have never talked to each other. And they're part of the same, the same club. And it happens a lot. Um, so again, examples of good practice, um, things I would try to encourage people to do Mix up your coaches. Don't don't be don't be lazy in in that in that sense. Mix up your coaches. Um, you wouldn't send your children to a school where they're going to have the same teachers for twelve years, thirteen years, seventeen years. You wouldn't. Okay, plain answer. Let's be honest. You wouldn't. So why do we accept it in sports? Okay, so you wouldn't send your, okay, another example. So um, your son has just come back from school and he goes, mum, dad, uh, today I was only allowed in geography for the last 10 minutes of the lesson. What? Yeah, yeah, I was only allowed for the last 10 minutes. So the lesson goes for an hour. I was only allowed for the last 10 minutes. And I'm sure you'll be knocking on somebody's door the next morning if it's not that same afternoon. Yet again, in sports, we go, okay, that's fine. Let the early developers play the majority of the game. And when we're winning 4-0, we'll put all the people on the pitch that were born eight months later than everyone else. That, that doesn't happen, does it? Nobody goes, what's, what's your selection policy? Okay, let's make it 50-50. Everybody plays the same amount of minutes than everyone else. Why? Because we want to develop everyone. Okay? Being born in the first quarter of the year doesn't give you an automatic passport to play more minutes. You're obviously going to be stronger. You're obviously going to have more experience. You obviously might be faster or, or whatever it is. And you might be, I don't know, the fourth brother or sister within your family. And everybody else plays soccer above you. So you're obviously going to have a lot more experience within the game. But that doesn't mean you should play more minutes than the person that is an only child, was born on the last quarter of the year, their parents don't watch sport, and um, they do PE twice a week in their school. There's no reason why. So again, good practice would be trying to develop every single individual. Good practice would be giving out some information around all these topics that we're sort of touching the, the surface of. Um, and again, it wouldn't happen on a day. It wouldn't happen on a website. Uh, it wouldn't happen on um, um, an hour meeting at the beginning of the season. Um, I think we need to be proactive in terms of what we're doing. Uh, yet again, I don't think it's a budget thing. I don't think it's a time thing. I think it's a creativity and we probably need to move away from what we always done uh, if these things are not happening very often, I would say. 
You know, it's brilliant that you give those examples. Actually, uh, I was having this conversation not very long ago, and um, and I'm sure that a lot of coaches. I mean, most coaches go through this at some point. That it's like because we teach, we we teach and we coach competitive sports. There's a misconception sometimes. A lot of times comes from the from the parents that it's um, that the competitive competitive sports are about winning. And um, I say like, look, winning it's it's always desired. If you want nobody nobody competes to lose, of course, but uh, with the intention to lose at least. But my job is to develop players and people. That comes first. That's the first priority. Then winning. If we can win, much better. But that's my first priority. And I have many arguments, believe it or not, around this subject. And I and I used to say one day I'm gonna write down a table like you're saying like if I were trying to win I would do this but if I were trying to develop players I would do this other and I think that's when people actually understand uh, what we're trying to do but it's I fundamental do, see, it really changes I do believe, uh, I yeah, do believe the fact that you have to have those conversations alone I'm sorry what I do believe you said you won't believe I have to have this argument alone but I do believe yeah I know I know. But Juan, I don't want to take much, much more of your time. So I actually would like to open it for a second to for Q and A. If somebody wants to ask something to Juan and stop listening to this guy with such a strong accent talking about me. <laughs> Please feel free to raise your hands um, if you want to. You can you can unmute yourselves and and ask. That's that's even best. John, you've got some cool scarves over there. I'm not going to lie. I'm looking for some. I know Deborah has some um, some questions. Deborah, would would you like your, to go yourself instead of um, me reading them? Let me find you if you want. Uh, some stuff in the chat. I don't have the chat open. Yeah, so. I was looking for it. But Deborah, if you want to, you can unmute yourself um, and and go ahead. I know one of her questions was. How do you see the development of children in the UK in comparison to the US? Um, hard to say, hard to say. Um, I don't spend that much time in, the, in, in America, I guess, but um, there was a very scary stat that came out a couple of years ago in the UK. Um, this was a lady that I won't remember her name now. She's a baroness. And she leads up um, uh, UK coaching, which is basically the governing body for coaching in the UK all sports. Um, she opened a statement a couple of years ago um, with a very scary quote that said something along the lines of somebody that's incarcerated would spend more time outside than children that are in primary school age in the UK which I just couldn't believe. Um, and that's got to do with, with PE and policy and stuff like that. So um, yeah, yet again, I don't spend enough time in America to, uh, to probably answer that. Uh, the environments have been in, in the last few years in America, um, around Colorado, around New York, um, around uh, California, uh, have been really cool. Really, really cool. I, th I think people are trying to do some great stuff. Uh, different sports again. Um, yeah, I think it's very different within education in the UK uh, between private and, and state education. Um, but yet again, I think the UK is very good at offering after school activities. So if people are curious and, and people want to, to go and try stuff and do some bits like that. Um, I think it's, uh, there are options, there are lots of options. Um, yeah, I mean, hard, hard to say. Um, it seems to me like in America, people get to go through more experiences, I would say. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I might be completely wrong here, but it seems to me like you get to experience more bits before you get to your college before you get to your university sort of level. Um, and I remember playing rugby in America. I was fortunate enough to study over there for a few years. Um, people seem to come from very different backgrounds, from athletics or track and field, 
and wrestling, uh, and there were some lift waiters as well in there. Um, yeah, it might have just been, it might just be in, uh, in rugby union, but uh, people tend to come to the sports a little bit later. Whereas, I mean, going back to my um, to my home country, which is Argentina, people tend to stay with sports throughout, and I think it's pretty much the same in 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 Britain, in England. Um, I think people go to the local hockey field hockey club and they just play hockey for 12 years and stuff like that so um, there is an tendency to go to gymnastics on a Thursday and go to uh, rugby on a Saturday and then perhaps go to horse riding on a Tuesday um, I don't know of many family members that actually have a week like that there is usually Tuesday and Saturdays at the local rugby club and that's pretty much it. But again, I mean, that's that's just my my experience. Um, Jose um, Alonso Saavedra, he's actually saying uh, there's a mess in my house, so I don't want to be noisy. But I want to say uh, uh, thank uh, you very much, Juan. I'm a truly I'm, a, I'm truly a fan of your work, and um, I'm following your website and the rugby talks almost every week. And he's saving money to go to the UK. Um, actually, <laughs> I have a follow up question on that. That it's like. Uh, for Sud America coaching, how's um, how's the workshop? Legend uh, Jose, you are my only fan. I've got one fan. Fantastic, <laughs> Jose. You can get a T-shirt. Um, uh, yeah, mate. Uh, thanks for that. I appreciate that. Um, let, let's connect. Let's connect. Send us a message. Um, sorry, what was the question? How's the workshop? Um, yeah, how's, how's, the, how's the workshop from Sud America? Every workshop is different. <laughs> um, every single workshop is different. Uh, I haven't done two presentations on, on keynote that look the same. Uh, there are obviously some some fundamental stuff in there, and there will be many authors that I would uh, again, once again quote um, that are that, that will appear. Some of them which we've had in this conversation. Um, but yet again, I think I think I will always start with. Um, so let's say if I'm in this room um, and, I, and I'm sitting with a, with a sports department or a PE department, um, I would always start with them and see see where they are, what are their stories of success, what sorts of things uh, is is getting them to wobble and to tick, which are two terms that I use a lot. Um, so what what makes you wobble? What makes you wobble in your lessons? What makes you wobble when you're sort of connecting with with young minds, with students, with pupils, with young sportsmen and women, children? Um, and what makes you what makes you tick? What makes you click? What makes you what puts a smile on your face? And then we pretty much go from there. Really, um, there would be very. I don't like to use the word chaotic because it makes people anxious, but there will be unorganized. I would say. Um, I've had decision makers within organizations, for example, I've had principals coming to me in a, in a pause or in a recess or whatever, going, um, why are we getting with all this? I mean, why have I got my staff out of lessons and we are, we are playing games in, in a room? Um, and I always, I always give them the same answer. Uh, well, we're going to where they want to be. Um, and they're experiencing what I like for them to provide for others. Um, I've never been asked to leave yet, so obviously they haven't, they haven't figured it out, but um, they will be chaotic, they will be messy, there will be lots of games. Uh, hopefully there'll be lots of laugh and smiles and stuff like that. Um, and we will always go back and use it as a starting point or as a development point, yeah. We would never say... Thank you very much at the end. Um, of course, I'll, I'll be grateful with people, uh, but I wouldn't wish them good luck. I wouldn't say, all right, off you go, yeah. Uh, I will always quote Seneca. I will always talk about uh, what the definition of luck for Seneca and myself is, uh, which is when, uh, when preparation meets opportunity, okay? So let's keep preparing. Let's, let's keep bringing up on opportunities and see what we can do. Um, and yet again, if, if we want to 
develop others, if we want to educate others, if we want to uh, develop people as a, as a whole, we got to be developing ourselves. So the idea of those sort of workshops would be, okay, we got to be better by the, by the end of this process. Now, the end of this process might not be four o'clock today when we all say our goodbyes. Uh, it might be in a couple of months' time. It might be in, in a year's time. Uh, but hopefully that is used as a, as a starting point rather than a, okay, we've done that, tick, CPD, done, off you go. See you next year, Juan. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, hopefully that will be the last thing I'm trying to, to facilitate. Amazing. Very good. Um, anybody else, anything that you would like to ask? Um, if not, uh, Juan, I thank you very much. Uh, in advance, hold on. Okay, I'm thanking you as, uh, as well. Um, if not, Juan, thank you very much for real for taking the time as always. Um, I hope I haven't done too bad of a job, or I'm sure there are a lot of questions that I could have asked you and I didn't. Um, so I, I'm gonna try to make that up, and um, let's let's do this. The last the last minute or the last phrase that whatever it takes uh, in terms of time, it's just for yourself. Whatever you would like to to tell the coaches or as a takeaway or, or something that you think is interesting or important. Uh, for me, yeah, just for you. I'm gonna throw I'm gonna throw it back to the room if that's okay with you. Absolutely. I'll get you to. There should be an option within your names in the participants panel. There should be an option that says rename. Um, try to try to get a couple of words in that you take away from this conversation. Okay, so so next to your name somewhere here, yeah, or in the three little dots. There should be an option that says rename. See if you can change your name to a word or a phrase or whatever you can fit in there that you take away from the conversation. I think that'd be better than me trying to give you some sort of sermon at the end. Well, these are good, these are good ideas. I think I'm gonna still like all this in the future. <laughs> hey, my my um my Zoom sort of levels have gone through the roof in the last year. So there you go. I'm going to do mine as well. I'm going to do mine as well. I've done mine. I've done mine. We've got a togetherness there. This is a tricky bit because we've lost people's names now. So wisdom, experience, we go over there. The rest of them fall asleep, inspired and empower. Love that one. Love all of them, actually. Mariana's got learning. First attempt in learning. There you go. You like that one. Cool. I'm trying to read a question from Winston and Experience. What is a good way to explain expectations and standards to families? Wow, um, it's a great question. Thank you. I don't know the actual name, but if you are called wisdom and experience, that's a great name. Um, a good way to explain expectations. Uh, I'm going to sound repetitive again. I think I would go towards the why again. So what we're doing, what you're doing. Why did you decide today to bring your child to this experience? Why did you decide... Um, that he or she should be playing football at Rush or whatever the organization is. Um, and I would pretty much take it from there. And if you had some sort of document, PDF, live website or whatever it is that states your why and it states your coaching philosophy, states the sort of experience that that child is going to go through, uh, that'll give you a very good um, agreeing point Okay, so perhaps this family turns up for the very first time. Uh, they're having a taste. Uh, uh, their daughter really likes the, what you're doing and she decides to come back. And um, perhaps you take five minutes of the next session and you go to mom and dad or whoever brought them that day and you go, so what do you think about, about the document? 
I bet you 99% of the cases they will go, oh, I'm, I'm really sorry, what document? And then you go on with it and you persist with it. And perhaps you got some sort of um, IT gig within your organization that can actually make it a, a sign-in document where you actually got to go and sign the document that you've read it, okay? And, and I think that's, that's a good way of establishing an agreement from day one. Um, I would try to encourage you to go, to go that way and, and give, it, give it a go. Um, uh, and then the second part of the question was, I have any given since then. Um, I think you're more experienced, or people that have been in that, that group for some time would actually give you a massive hand. Okay, perhaps you can establish within your team. Um, I mean, and I take this from human resources. Um, there, are, there are a couple of very famous companies around the world that will try to. So you name the uh, Google, HP, um, John Deere. Uh, some of these companies or all of these companies will try to create the best first day for new employers. Okay. Um, and anything that you can imagine. So your name written down on your desk or, or having all your IT gadgets ready to go. Um, uh, 10 minutes with the CEO of the company. Um, I don't know, a, a private car that takes you to your first day of, so you don't have to worry about the train or the bus or, or the subway or whatever it is. Um, so the best possible experience for your first day. Okay, so we know, um, oh, sorry, I don't know your name. So wisdom and experience, um, actually I'm gonna call you wisdom experience. So wisdom is your first name, experience is your last name right now. Uh, it's gonna turn up on Tuesday for the first time. Okay, eight o'clock. We're going to have his whole team waiting for um, for you on uh, the lobby. Yeah, uh, just before nine, everybody's going to be there to welcome you. How would you feel on your first day? So as soon as you sit down on your desk, everything's got your name, you got your phone ready to go, you got your MacBook, your PC ready to go, you got your favorite drink next to you, and you name it. Okay, so all these companies have gone through lots, lots of trouble to try to create that. Why? Because they want to start people with the right food. They want to create the best experience to go from there. And the challenge would be to try to maintain that. The challenge would be not for that to be the best experience ever and then to go downhill from there. The challenge would be to leave that, I'm not going to say every day, but the majority of them. Okay, so why don't you try to create within your team the best possible first day. So boys, girls, we now uh, have a little Johnny here. It's his first day. You guys know what to do. Wink. Okay? And that's, that's it. And it just treats, it, it, it takes care of itself because you've rehearsed it, because you spent some time on it, because you put people in, the, in each other's shoes. Yeah? Um, and I love that experience, but I think it's a bit missing, which is we got to remove our own shoes before we go into somebody else's shoes. Okay, and then you take it from there. Okay, I bet you some boys and girls in your team, and I don't know why I'm assuming you're working with children, um, will be absolutely all over the fact that they're now the wizards of the first day. And that is one of the main roles in the team. You got your midfielders, you got your goalkeepers, you got your penalty shooter executors, and now you got the wizards of the first day. It doesn't have to be all of them. It could be a couple of them. Yeah, it doesn't have to be, I don't know, ceremonial or, or, or tense or awkward. Um, it's just something that, that is happening. Yeah? Um, but let me know, mate. Let, let me know. Let's connect. Let's connect. Let me know if, if that helps or not. Um, it was a massive question. Hopefully, hopefully you take something, something away. Uh, humility, what are you saying? Love the analogy of different teachers for the school. Yeah, mate, use it. Talk to your parents about it. Um, I think some of them will, will actually get that penny to, to drop the back of their heads. Um, I, would do, I would do lots of up and downs within the season. Perhaps your second Saturday of the month, 
you just get a different coach, you get a different voice, different relationship. You get to know people as you go through the club. So you don't turn up on your first day of under 14s, not knowing who those adults are, because you've had them 10 times before, since you were in under sevens, till you got to under 14s, uh, or not, or, or you've had them a couple of times in the last month, or, or whatever it is. Um, so find a way, find a way not to be, again, I think, I think it goes down to laziness. She's so okay, well, I'm the dad of the under 12s, and I've been with the under 12 six years, and I've got another five years to go. Yeah, which I hear a lot. So hopefully that's helpful, mate. I don't know if you're a mate or a lady. Humility for now. Humility. <laughs> I, love I love it. Um, Juan, I want I, I super I, I, I could stay all day, but um, I want to be respectful of your time, and I know that it's late, really late where you are. So, um, thanks very much for real for everything. Um, I love that. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Hopefully, we'll get to we'll get to see you in person soon. Do something oh, together. Cool. That would be wonderful. Also, make uh, I'll just rename myself again. If you want to connect over social media, all the usual ones. So. Um, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, I don't use a lot. Uh, Twitter, uh, just, just drop us a message and hopefully this is a starting point once again. So Absolutely. thank you very much for your time. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Juan, again. Take care. Get some rest over there. Stay safe. See you soon. Bye-bye.